Welcome to the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art. We're in the middle of the winter trimester of 2019, my course on the alchemy of paint. And we've been focusing on alchemy in these series of lectures. Now I want to shift more towards paint and how alchemy relates to paint. I will give two lectures today, one on mediums and one on pigments. I'm beginning with mediums and I particularly like this example here because this beautiful glass globe that you see here can only be created if the artist has a thoroughgoing knowledge of mediums, of how to create transparency, solidity, a various mixture of them both in order for the pigment to just lie transparently on top of the colors beneath it. So let's look deeper into mediums and how to create mediums. Recall that oil painting, so to speak, oil painting, in fact consists of a pigment in a binding medium. And the pigment, which we will look at in our next presentation, can be either from minerals, from plants and animals, it could be a dye, it can be from metals or so on. And via all these different ingredients, we are able to create ground pigment. This powdered pigment is then put in a binding medium. That can be oil, but it might also consist of turpentine, varnish, egg tempera, and we'll look at all these different possibilities for binding media over the course of this lecture. Before I begin, I would like to bring to mind that oil painting has a long history, that we would never have had oil painting if it wasn't for what came before it, and humans' desire to combine pigments with different media in order to create works of art. And as you can see here, encaustic, egg tempera, mosaic, fresco, sculpture, stained glass, illuminated manuscripts, these all play a role in the eventual creation of oil painting. So let's begin with encaustic from the Greco-Egyptian period. And here you can even see on the far right how this appears somewhat unfinished, or at least the brush strokes are remaining. How did the artist create this portrait of a woman from the years around 90 to 120 uh, in the Roman domination of Egypt? Well, he took wax and he melted the wax in a device that was called a kerotakis. Kerotakis is mentioned many times by the alchemist Zosimos, who is also alive in this period, because the Keratakis was a new invention that allowed both the melting of the wax for encaustic, but also for the tinting of metals. And it was used to change the color of the surface of metals. Basically, the substance was placed here, heated, and other substances were placed in, inside. For encaustic, then, the Keratakis was used to melt the wax. You see the wax here on the left. And then in the melted wax, you could grind and mix in the pigments. And while the wax was still hot and in liquid form, it would be applied to the painting and you would paint. And it was quite a heavy, thick substance, but they were able nevertheless to combine colors and blend them and create these amazing portraits that show the faces of those who have passed before us. These are actually from the burial, these are burial portraits to remind us of who was buried in this coffin. Then we come to Byzantine egg tempera, and so the Byzantine period, which extends from around 500 uh, in the common era to 1500. The common use of egg tempera in Byzantine art, and these two excellent examples by Andrei Rublev, who was a later Russian painter. To make egg tempera, then, you can take just the yolk and pierce the yolk and use the yellow of the egg and combine the yellow of the egg with these pigments. And once you grind them together, you have your uh, basic substance. Adding water 
to that, to thin it, we'll make the tempera, the mixture of water and egg that's then applied with a brush. And if you look at this example by Andrei Rublev, you can see that hatching is very important. It's difficult to make large areas with egg tempera if you want to work fine because of the water-based medium of the egg tempera, you create all these beautiful lines and hatchings to create the volumes within the figure. So we're still in the Byzantine period, but aside from egg tempera, they also created many mosaics. And our knowledge of gold, our knowledge of lapis lazuli in the blues, this is all coming to us from mosaic as well. Here we're taking these precious pigments from, say, lapis lazuli, we're grinding them, and now we're using a kiln to heat them, and through faience, through glass making, and through ceramics, we're creating all these different colored tiles. And these different colored tiles will be combined to create the mosaic. Gothic sculpture. So now we're moving away from the Byzantine period to Europe from 1100 up until around 1400. They created both stone sculptures on the facades of the cathedrals and wooden sculptures in the interior. And we tend to forget that both of these were painted. They were polychromed and they had to use various paints, both for the wood, a kind of a lacquer, and paint the statues with their lacquer and the external weather-resistant paints for the facades during this period. It's a knowledge which is, for the most part, lost. During the Gothic period, you also had the beautiful stained glass windows of, say, Chartres or Notre Dame. And here now, uh, we do have some knowledge, thanks to Theophilius, of how he was able to create the famous stained glass that appears in the cathedrals in the Middle Ages. He would take various metals, such as iron oxides, magnesium oxides, cobalt oxides, and by heating them and combining them with the glass, that's what would allow them to create their plates of stained glass that were then cut and put into their lead frames. Uh, so notice all of these metals, which we use today in our pigments, manganese, we use cobalt, we use copper, will be used. All of this knowledge of pigments that goes through history. But now the binding medium is glass. Another example of glass as your binding medium is Gothic enamel. And this might not be obvious at first glance, but this was an important art form during the Gothic period where you had this metal foundation and in this metal foundation you placed molten glass and the molten glass became the enamel. So here you can see what was called vitreous enamel was a fusing of a powdered glass to a metal substrate by firing. You then put it in the kiln and that allowed it to melt and fuse with the metal. A very interesting technique. Now we come to painting proper and during the Italian Renaissance the most popular form of painting was fresco. This did not really occur in the northern part of Europe above the Alps because of the dampness of the walls but in the southern part you could use fresco. You begin with the intonaco, which is a kind of a plaster made from lime putty, and you add in sand or volcanic ash or perhaps marble powder to thicken it, and then you put that on the wall. As it dries, you wait perhaps half an hour, maybe an hour, until it's a bit more solid, and then you can do the transfer of the cartone. So you prick your cartone, and then you pounce with black charcoal to allow dots to come through the holes to give you an idea of where you're working. Next, you begin the fresco proper. And you only have one day in which to work because the plaster is drying. This one day is the giornata in Italian. 
And so during the course of your giornata, you're first doing the general blocking in of the base colors and then adding the details towards the end. And you must finish by the end of the day. It's not possible to reanimate your plaster. It has to dry on its own. So that's the art of fresco. And they would do one section at a time along the wall, all these series of giornate. Medieval illuminated manuscripts. Also another source of oil painting. And we recall that uh, Jan van Eyck and his brother Hubertus, Jan is credited as the inventor of oil painting. Well, he probably illuminated manuscripts before he was an oil painter. And they have found these examples, which scholars believe are examples from the hand of Hubertus or Jan van Eyck. How did he create these fine examples of the books of ours? He used gum Arabic or glare, and glare being the egg, but now you're using the egg white rather than the yellow egg that you used for your egg tempera. So either with the glare, the egg white, or the gum Arabic, you mix in your pigments, and then you're able to create these beautiful illuminations. Of course, calligraphy played a large role in illuminated manuscripts, calligraphy in ink, and ink uses oxgall plus lamp black to create the inky tones, uh, and the famous gilding with gold and silver as the final additions to make a beautiful illuminated manuscript. So those are the various implements that you will use, grinding all your different precious stones like lapis lazuli or cinnabar, uh, orpiment or whatever, to create your blues, your reds and your yellows, and these can be then mixed to create other tones. Finally, we come to oil painting proper. And in a story from Vasari, Oil painting and the invention of oil painting is accredited to Jan van Eyck. Definitely, oil painting is something from the northern part of Europe, from the Netherlands, which then moved down across the Alps to Italy during the Renaissance. And painters like, say, Botticelli were egg tempera painters, whereas Leonardo switched over to oils and now oils Thanks to and Andrei de Messina, oils took over painting during the Renaissance in Italy. What did Jan van Eyck do? The story is that he had painted a panel and set it out to dry, and the panel cracked in the sunlight, and he decided to find some other method for painting rather than egg tempera. And so he mixed the pigment with oils, specifically with linseed oil. And by grinding the pigments into the linseed oil, he was able to create a finer form of oil, which allowed for the finesse that you see in Van Eyck's paintings, as well as the deep, rich colors that give oil painting its unique quality. So this then is the beginning of oil painting. Whether it was actually Jan Van Eyck or not, we never know. But around the time of his life in the 1400s, this is when oil painting emerged. Here in Vienna, we practice a technique called the Misch technique, which mixes oil and egg tempera painting. It was in fact developed by Professor Ernst Fuchs of the Vienna School of Fantastic Realism, who you see here on the right. And on the left is an unfinished painting in the Misch technique, which gives you an idea of how it combines oil and egg tempera. I was fortunate in that I was able to study and apprentice with Ernst Fuchs, both in Klagenfurt, in a chapel that he was creating in the south of Austria, as well as in Monaco, where he had his main studio. And over the course of a year, as I worked with him, I learned in the way of master and apprentice how to gradually acquire this Misch technique. So what's interesting about the Misch technique is that it combines two venerable traditions of painting. We saw that Byzantine painting was basically done in egg tempera, and egg tempera has a history of about a thousand years or longer as a painting technique. 
Oil painting has a history of around 500 years. And so you're taking these two techniques of egg tempera painting and oil painting and combining them in this mixed or mish technique. Now, the way that you combine these two is you begin with an imprimatura, which you see on the bottom here, say in red, and you have your base coat in red, and that is using an oleo varnish medium. And on top of this, you come in with your white egg tempera. And with your white egg tempera, you develop the volumes and the forms just in whites. And egg tempera is a water-based medium. You're dipping your brush in water and egg tempera and making fine, fine lines. Then you glaze over those volumes with your color. And so you use an oleo varnish medium to glaze over. And you can begin again with the egg tempera at a higher level, glaze again. And so it's this process of developing the painting in layers. It's a layered painting process as opposed to, say, direct painting. We come back then to this example of an unfinished painting by Professor Ernst Fuchs. And here you can see the red imprimatura. And on top of the red imprimatura, in very fine lines, he's developed these forms using the whites. And then he's glazed over the whites here and here and here. And in fact, over here, he's coming back with the whites again to develop the volumes even more with the highlights. And that gives you a sense of how it works. This is another detail of a painting by Ernst Fuchs. And you understand that egg tempera is a very different substance compared to oils because of the fineness of the lines that you get by dipping your brush in water. And you end up using hatching quite a bit, but very, very, very fine hatching to develop these very fine details, which here you can see are glazed over in red and create the volumes that way. And then you come back with the whites until everything is developed to the finest degree of perfection. So how do you create the egg tempera? First, you begin with the egg tempera emulsion. And the emulsion uses the whole egg, which you see over here, and that becomes the measure. And so you break an egg, you mix it, you remove any large pieces that might be uh, getting in your way, and you pour that in so that you have one measure. Then you have your measure of varnish. This could be Damar varnish, or you could have a mixture an oleo varnish, half oil, half varnish, which is a fatter kind of medium, one measure. And two measures of water. You mix the uh, oleo varnish and the water with the egg to make your emulsion. Now, this is, in a pure sense, alchemy. And it's alchemy because normally oil and water don't mix. Oil we can think of as the king, water as the queen. Normally the king and the queen would remain separate. But because of the albumin in the egg, you have an emulsifying agent. And this emulsifying agent allows the water and the oil to join on the molecular level so that they become one. And you have both the unique qualities of oil and water through the egg in egg tempera. You then take your egg tempera emulsion, you grind in your white pigment, and after grinding in the white pigment, you can begin to paint. And of course, you could grind in any other pigment if you wish. Now you get a sense of the alchemy, and in the Rosarium Philosophorum, the stages are described as those of conjunction and death and rebirth, where the two opposites, the male and the female, or in our case, the oil and the water, come together in their bath with a third element, and that third element being the emulsifier, the egg. They join, and in their joining, they must, in a certain sense, undergo a death. The oil loses some of its qualities, the water some of its qualities, so that when they rise up, they become this unique oily watery substance that is the egg tempera emulsion. 
Now, how about the color glazing? Uh, in order to glaze over your egg tempera, you need some form of oil, an oil paint mixed in color. So, we create an oleo varnish medium, and the, so to speak, holy trinity uses turpentine, oil, and varnish. These being the three primary ingredients you might want to use in any medium. Of course, you could create a medium with just oil and just turpentine if you want to. Indeed, you can try to paint just in turpentine or just in oil or just in varnish, but you probably won't get very far because each plays its specific role in the creation of an oleo varnish medium. So this layer here is done with the oleo varnish medium, this layer with the egg tempera, then we glaze transparently or semi-transparently in the oleo varnish medium before continuing with the egg tempera in the mish technique. Let's go a bit deeper into each one of these, turpentine, oil, and varnish. Turpentines are basically a distillation of resin, and this distillation goes under many names, sometimes called spirit of turpentine or essence of turpentine, also rectified turpentine, turpentine oil, or just quite simply terps. You also have balsam turpentine. Now, this is quite separate from another solvent called mineral spirits, which is a petroleum distillate. It's the distillation of a petroleum product called white spirit in Europe, mineral spirits in general. This is quite a different substance, but still used as an essential oil uh, like a turpentine. Oils then, you mostly find linseed oil in your tubes of oil paint. Chances are what you have is linseed oil. It's a drying oil pressed from seeds, but you can also find stand oil, walnut oil, poppy oil, indeed many different types. These are different from alkydes, which were developed in the 60s and 70s. And uh, it also is a petroleum distillate, the alkydes like liquin, and they were developed because they dry much, much faster than traditional oils. Finally, you have varnish. Varnish is also a resin, but it's a resin in which the essential oil has been evaporated. And you find flat satin or glossy varnishes. Typically, you have the soft resins like damar and mastic, the hard resins like copal and amber. Last of all, I want to mention other materials which are like varnish, but uh, come under the category of turpentines, and that would be Canada balsam, which comes from the fir tree, and Venetian turpentine, which comes from the larch tree, both of these being thick and sticky and very much a, a varnish, even though we say Venetian turpentine. So here is your classic linseed oil. You take flax seeds, and indeed you can eat the flax seeds. You could drink the linseed oil, but don't drink the one that comes from the factory. Uh, and by pressing the flax seeds, you obtain the oil, and that oil is then used to mix the pigments to create the oil for your painting. Over time, artists have experimented with many different types of oil, some of which dry more quickly, some of which dry more slowly, some of which combine well with pigments and some which don't. Poppy oil from the poppy seeds are used by artists, but rarely. Perilla oil, not really. Linseed oil, definitely. Olive oil, no, not at all. It takes too long to dry, it's too thin. Walnut oil from crushed walnuts, yes. And Leonardo, for example, used walnut oil quite a bit. Its disadvantage is that it takes a long time to dry, but its advantage is it creates a very fine oil. Pumpkin seed oil, no, that didn't quite work either over the course of time. Let's look at varnishes and turpentines. Now, think of a coniferous tree and how this coniferous tree can be cut and this substance comes out which is kind of white and very strong in smell. That is the balsam. And from harvesting balsam, we can create the resins and essential oils that 
will make up our varnishes and our turpentines. Let's begin then with turpentine. You take your balsam and you heat it and you distill it. And what the distillation, the essential oil, is what rises to the top and then gets condensed here and falls and is purified. So the purified balsam is the essential oil, which is your turpentine. However, they must purify it several times, distill it several times, in order to get a really pure turpentine. Modern technology uses the rectification process where instead of distilling in this matter, you rather use a form of oven that allows the substance to rise up and then it condenses here and then can rise again and condense and rise again and condense and then rise a second time and condense, rise a second time and condense and so on here. So multiple distillation through rectification and this becomes your rectified turpentine. Once you've removed the essential oil from the balsam, you're left with a resin and this resin can be very hard once it's dried and in fact when you buy Damar resin you can buy it in this form of crystals. And what you must do now with your crystals is soak them in turpentine so it's to recombine this resin into a varnish. And then finally at the end of the process you will have your varnish. In this diagram I've tried to show you the different ways of obtaining oils and varnishes then. On the left you can see these deciduous type of plants or trees and from the deciduous we get the seeds and the nuts like for example a walnut tree would give us walnuts. These get pressed and from pressing the nuts or the seeds we get linseed oil from flax, walnut oil from walnuts, poppy oil from poppy seeds, etc. In the case of what is called stand oil there were two different ways to create stand oil. Traditionally you took your linseed oil and you let it stand in the sun and gradually it would thicken and this thicken stand oil would dry much faster and have a, a, a heavier thickness compared to the linseed oil. Nowadays uh, it is boiled and by boiling it you can polymerize the oil to make it thicker and so you create stand oil in this fashion. In the middle I've included dryers, dryers which come from minerals like lead, cobalt and manganese and these are then cooked and mixed in damar to create things like sicative of Harlem, sicative of Courtai, sicative coming from the Latin word to dry so this will help your oil paints dry faster. They can of course damage your painting by darkening it over time. On the other hand Lead is used to create lead white, cobalt is used to create yellow, manganese to create blue. We do have these minerals in our pigments anyway and those pigments tend to dry faster than the other pigments. On the far right, the coniferous tree, different from the deciduous tree and as we saw you take your oleoresinous balsam out of the coniferous tree and from that you can make your various resins or varnishes and turpentines. Uh, if you remove the resin by distillation then you end up with the essential oil which is rectified turpentine. Uh, I also use oil of spiked lavender. You're doing the same process but now you're using the stems from the lavender bush and by using the stem of the lavender bush you create oil of spike lavender, essence d'aspic in French. And this is very popular in France as a replacement for rectified turpentine and I recommend it as well using half-half oil of spiked lavender, half rectified terps. On the right then you have the varnishes that result by removing the essential oils through evaporation or through distillation. And once you remove the essential oils through distillation, you take your resulting resin, 
dissolve it in turpentine again, and then you have your soft varnish, such as uh, damar or mastic, and your hard varnish like amber and copal. I would like to conclude this talk by discussing the different qualities of each of these, turpentine, oil and varnish, so you understand better why we would mix each of these to create one medium. And to describe them, I would like to use the planets and the qualities of the planets, beginning with turpentine. If you were to paint with turpentine by itself, you would find that the color would move very quickly because the turpentine has this quality of creating a quick dispersion. And in fact, it does not bind, it creates separations in the binder to allow it to move more quickly. And once it does that, it evaporates. So it has this mercurial-like spirit of speed and quickness, but it also, like this wing-footed god, will then fly up in the air, and that's what you're smelling when you are painting with a medium that has turpentine. You're smelling the evaporated turpentine in the air. On the other hand, turpentine can be dangerous, and too much of it is a bad thing. It then has these martial-like qualities, like the planet Mars. It's very volatile. And especially in a layered painting process, like we use in the Misch technique, it can lift up the lower layers, it can burn through to the lower layers and disturb them. So this volatile quality of turpentine must be kept in check by not putting too much of it. Also, it tends to dry to a fairly flat finish, which, for example, the varnish will counteract. The oil is the most important aspect of any medium because it's the binder and indeed it's what's binding your pigments in your oil paints. So it has that Venetian-like quality of love, of holding things together. It's the adhesion of the color particles. Because of that, it tends to be very slow and heavy. And if you try to paint with, say, stand oil by itself, you'll find yourself that the brush is dragging. It needs the turpentine to cut it to allow it to move. Uh, it also has these Saturnine qualities of long drying time. Saturn, having been Kronos, was the god of time. And indeed, oil needs time to dry. It needs days to dry in order to paint over it. In fact, it continues to dry for hundreds of years. And when you see a painting cracking, it's because slowly with the craqueleur, the fine, fine cracks, those are in fact the result of the oil still drying 200, 300 years later. Finally, on the far right, you have the varnish. And I say the varnish has qualities both of the sun and the moon. Like the sun, the varnish allows the colors to glow more and it gives them more, more penetration of light occurs into the pigments to allow them to shine. So it intensifies the color and also on the surface, particularly if you're using a glossy varnish, it gives a brilliant finish and that also allows for the colors to shine. Now, on the other hand, there are these lunar qualities to varnish. And one is that it does give this glowing quality, which we like, but also it's a very sticky kind of medium. And as a sticky medium, it leaves marks, it leaves the brush strokes. This can be counteracted through the turpentine and also through oil of spike lavender, uh, as well as by the oil. But uh, one of the negative qualities of any varnish is its stickiness which leaves all the patterns behind of the brush strokes. So that kind of gives you an overview of the different qualities. And in a good medium, we're going to mix perhaps one to one to one, although you can also vary your combinations to create a medium that's the ideal medium that allows you to create a beautiful oil painting. Uh, in my next talk, I'll be talking about the pigments, but here I'm very happy to have explored, touched the surface, but explored a little bit the different qualities that make up any decent medium in oil painting. So thank you very much for listening. Welcome to
to this next lecture on the series on alchemy and paint. We're here at the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art. It's the 2019 winter trimester. And in this particular presentation, I want to go into the alchemy of historical pigments. In another lecture, I already talked about binding media like oil, turpentine, and varnish. In this lecture now, I'm going to focus on pigments. Uh, because oil painting basically consists of a pigment in a binding medium. So we need to understand better pigments, where they come from as minerals, plant and animal dyes, metals and so on. I want to begin by reminding you that the artist throughout history was always a craftsman. He was a businessman, he ran his business, he had a studio filled with assistants, and so he had to calculate his costs and he had to know his materials. You see on the far right in this uh, image of an artist's studio that his assistants are grinding pigments, first uh, grinding them down into a powder and then using a muller to add the pigments to oils to create the oil paints. And then these are being used in these other images that you see in the center over here by the artist to create the work. So a true artist studio was creating as well as using all of these different pigments. And an artist had to have a good knowledge of pigments. If we want to get an idea of how to separate these pigments in our mind, we can use the categories of inorganic and organic pigments, although many other classifications are possible. In the inorganic pigments, you have the minerals, all of them based on some kind of a stone. So ochres, umbers, siennas, but also cinnabar or lapis lazuli would all be mineral pigments. While metals also contribute to our pigments, lead creating lead white or lead red, copper creating verdigris, manganese creating blue, titanium creating white, and so on. All metal-based pigments. Meanwhile, in the organic realm, you have plant and animal dyes, which are typically called lakes. For example, indigo, which comes from the indigofera leaf or rose matter lake coming from the matter root that you see in the picture over here. Also another interesting conundrum of uh, paints is this caramese or cochineal beetle that produces the red pigment that we use in carmine red. We'll look at all of these more in detail, but those are your inorganic and organic pigments. We can also think of pigments through these opposites. Some pigments absorb oil and they have a high absorption of oil, where others have a low absorption of oil. And when you grind the pigment into the oil, you get a sense for this. Some become very slow drying pigments, other become fast drying pigments. The faster drying pigments typically being, for example, cobalt or manganese or lead, like lead white. Some are more transparent, especially true of the lakes and dyes. Some are more opaque. Some are light fast, so they won't fade uh, in bright light. Others are less light fast and it depends on the pigment. Finally, some are indeed toxic, like lead and others are non-toxic. When you buy, for example, Old Holland paints, you can also receive a list. And this list not only tells you the different ingredients that go into your color. If I take, for example, the brilliant yellow here, I know that it's a combination of PW4, PW6, PY35, and so on. This PW pigment white, PY pigment yellow, and there's a system for classifying all of the different chemicals that go in to create different dyes and pigments. Then you also get the actual metals that are being used to create that yellow, and further you can see both its transparency, its light fastness, its drying time, and the oil, uh, the amount of oil it contains. So, 
various products like Old Holland or Michael Harding or uh, Rublev, these kind of products which are more traditional artist pigments will make the color more apparent to you as to what's actually going into the tube. Let's have a look now at an artist's palette from the 1500s, Hieronymus Bosch and uh, an image from his Garden of Earthly Delights. And scholars have been able to restore his works and in the process of restoration, analyze what uh, pigments he's been using. And typically Bosch would use yellow ochre, also lead tin yellow, you might be less familiar with this pigment, azurite for his blues, vermilion for his reds, you can see that this is typically a vermilion like color, whereas the darker red that you see on the top right is more of a carmine lake, malachite for his greens, copper resonate also for greens, lead white, he would never, uh, it was impossible to use titanium white since it was only invented uh, in the last century, and ivory black. So that would be your basic limited palette of a painter from this time period. If we look at Caravaggio or Rembrandt, so about a hundred years later then, now both of these artists used more restricted palettes, they tended more towards the browns. Caravaggio using umbers and ochres, as well as vermilion, lead white, carbon black, lead tin yellow and copper resonate for his greens. Rembrandt used also yellow ochre, umber, lead tin yellow, azurite for his blues, smalt for his blues, carmen lake reds, malachite greens, bone black, lead white, vermilion, ultramarine and naples yellow. An interesting anecdote that was told to me from Ernst Fuchs who Dali had told him this story that Dali believed Rembrandt must have been colorblind, particularly in the green-blue spectrum, because there is a great absence of greens and blues in Rembrandt's work. However, it is interesting that he did indeed use smalt and azurite, which are two distinctly different blues, uh, in his palette. Let's begin now by going through each of the major colors and their pigments, beginning with white and black and moving through the primary colors, and look at them from the standpoint of history and how these colors were used over the course of history. So I've created a series of diagrams and it begins in prehistory with the Paleolithic cave paintings. And this goes back as far as 30,000 before the Common Era. And then we have antiquity over here. So from the Egyptians to the Greeks and Romans, then the Middle Ages from 400 to 1400, the Renaissance 1400 to 1600, the Enlightenment 1600 to 1800, the Industrial Age, 1800, 1900, and our modern period after 1900. Beginning with white then, lime white, which is basically calcium carbonate or chalk, uh, has been used as a white from time immemorial. Uh, it's not a very strong white, but it lasts, and it's still used in Italy, for example, as uh, Bianco di San Giovanni. It was used during the Renaissance as well, and we can still use chalk and mix chalk into our paints to give them a certain thickness. But lead white appeared from around 400 BCE in ancient Greece, taking the metal lead and putting it uh, in vinegar or suspending it above vinegar, and with a bit of a heat, a rust develops on the lead creating this white that's scraped away, and you have your lead white. This goes all through artistic history, through the Middle Ages, into the Renaissance and beyond, until the invention of zinc white in 1850. And we continue to use zinc white, PW4, uh, to this day, although it was replaced by titanium white in 1921, titanium white being PW6. And most artists today will use titanium white, which is a fairly bluish cold uh, white, 
In contrast to lead white, which granted it's potentially toxic, but it's a much warmer, much faster drying white. As for blacks, you have your carbon black and you have your bone black. Carbon black, which as a result of carbonizing uh, plant matter or anything, seeds and so forth, gives you a carbon black. Whereas bone black, now you're carbonizing actual animal material like bones to create your black. Uh, both of these have been used since the times of prehistory and still used today. But Mars black now appears in the early 20th century. It's an iron oxide and so from iron we can create a very stable, strong black. This gives you an example of how to create lead white. You can see here that you have your coil of lead and it's been placed in a container and surrounded by horse manure or horse dung. And this is used to create a kind of a slow heat. And inside there's vinegar which is being used as an acid to help oxidize the lead to create this rust. So you keep it in this form and over the course of 8 to 12 weeks eventually the rust will form that you scrape off and that gives you your lead white. And in fact, lead white is still being created in this or a similar fashion today. For blacks, and I have Timmy Italian to thank for these slides. She teaches here at the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art. Uh, she did an experiment where she was taking uh, seeds or pits and placing them in a sealed container, which was then placed in a very hot fire in order to calcine and blacken that organic material and what came out was something like this. And then with a mortar and pestle you can crush that material and you end up with your carbon black. The same process is basically used for bone black and now you take bone for example and you put it in an intense fire so that it calcines and then you finally create it a powdered form that can be mixed with your oil and painted with. And this painting or a fragment of a painting by Edward Manet, he was very well known for using blacks in his work and he had an intense love of black. So moving on to the primary colors now and yellow. Yellow has of course a long and interesting history as a color. In prehistory then you have a mineral pigment, yellow ochre. Uh, this is PY43, it's an iron oxyhydroxide. Then in the Egyptian period orpiment came about. Orpiment actually being arsenic sulfide, so a toxic pigment. And even though it was toxic it was still used both in makeup and in other places from ancient Egypt all the way through history until about the industrial age. So it was an important color during the Renaissance and every Renaissance artist had their orpiment. Uh, Naples yellow is basically made from lead and here it's listed as being from 1500 to the present. It was used during the Renaissance. It's an understanding of lead being able to be heated and converted from white to yellow to red is actually much older, but uh, it is used as an artist's pigment from around the Renaissance forward. Also during the Renaissance, they used lead tin yellow one and lead tin yellow two. It depends on which form of lead you're using to create it. This pigment was also called massicot or litharge and is basically uh, a lead tin oxide made from lead stannate. From lead tin, the other common pigment that was used uh, fairly early in history is Indian yellow. And Indian yellow, as is well known, was extracted from the urine of cows that were fed mango leaves. And this was actually forbidden by the British government 
in the 1800s, or late 1800s, and so uh, we, the production of genuine Indian yellow stopped around the year 1900. Gamboge yellow, which is a gum resin from the Garcinia tree, uh, was also used, but unfortunately it's not a very stable pigment, it fades and it's also toxic, so its history was not as long. Coming to the industrial age then, new yellows were invented to replace these other uh, unstable or toxic materials. And this is where you get, for example, chrome yellow. Chrome, unfortunately, was also toxic. And as Vincent van Gogh discovered when he ate his pigments in a fit of madness, uh, it could be extremely toxic. So it was discontinued by the year 1900. Cadmium yellow, cobalt yellow, so these date from 1820, 1852. So we're taking these metals and by heating them we're able to create a yellow pigment that can then be used uh, in painting. Let's have a look at some examples of all of these. Uh, orpiment then, which comes in this form and then is ground into a powder was known as the golden pigment, the ori pigmentum in Latin. Here you have lead tin yellow and lead tin yellow coming from an, an amalgam of lead and tin. Our lead arising from galena ore and tin arising from uh, cassiterite. In this example here, you can see on the far right that lead white uh, was being used and unfortunately the lead white reacted with the surrounding colors and darkened. So originally all of these faces were white but the lead white then reacted. The yellow areas is para-realgar or realgar. We'll see that in our next slides on red. It was a kind of orangey red pigment. And here at the bottom, the highlights, just barely visible, still are from orpiment, while the red was from vermilion. If you take a painting by Raphael, such as this one, the Sistine Madonna, and examine the Pope's mantle here, you'll find that he used yellow ochre and lead white, but also green earth charcoal black and traces of vermilion to create that effect. On the top right, the Veronese allegory of love then, using orpiment to create those beautiful yellow tones that you see in the greenish uh, yellow garment on the far right. More examples of yellow pigments then, Naples yellow coming from lead was used to create the beautiful garment that you see here in the center and on the far right vermeer lead tin yellow to create those beautiful yellow pigments. A few more examples here again realgar which is this orangey pigment made from arsenic disulfate and you can see its unique qualities somewhat yellow somewhat red a genuine orange tone. On the right, Vincent van Gogh using his chrome yellow to create those beautiful wheat fields in a typically post-impressionist painting. Let us now look at the reds and their interesting history. Again, mineral pigments like ochre, red ochre in this case, going back into prehistory and used in cave paintings and all the way through history. Then quite early uh, here, even in Egyptian times, Madder Lake was used, this dye from the Madder root, which is labeled as uh, NR9 in our pigment charts. Minium, which is to say red lead, uh, arising in ancient Greece and used all the way until 1820. So passing through the Byzantine, Persian and medieval periods, even though it was toxic and even though it can fade. 
It depends on how it's used and in what combination with other materials. Vermilion has a very long history. As we've seen in our other presentations, it is a mercuric sulfide from cinnabar. Uh, on the other hand, it does react or darken depending on the other colors which are surrounding it. And so it was eventually replaced by cadmium red. Realgar here also arose in ancient Greece and was used up until about 1850, but it is toxic based on arsenic, it being arsenic disulfide. However, it had such a unique orange quality that artists came to love it. On the other hand, it can be unstable as well. Moving into the Renaissance then, from 1400 onward, carmine or crimson, which is extracted from the Kermes uh, beetle, but it is not very stable, it fades. Burnt carmine then, also from the same period, extracted from the female cochineal insect. By the industrial age then, they started to create artificial colors that were more stable, like cadmium red from 1820 to the present, as well as synthetic alizarin. And in our modern period now, we have a whole range of reds, including, say, naphthol red or perylene red. And there are many examples I could give you these PR numbers multiplying, because in the present industrial age, all of these pigments are then used in an industrial fashion and combined with plastics or other materials in order to create the red that we use in everyday life. So here is an example of a cave painting which would date back up to 30,000 years before the Common Era. You can see the red ochre that was used and here the uh, figure who is in fact missing, uh, it seems, the last part of this digit, since they sometimes sacrificed one of their joints, would hold their hand up to the wall and spray a liquid with the red ochre to create these imprints. The typical ochres, umbers, siennas, all of them are created through iron oxides in the earth and they occur naturally. They can then be ground and applied to the walls to create these beautiful ancient Paleolithic animal uh, paintings. Minium, we mentioned, comes from lead. It's a red lead. And if you find it lead in its natural form in the Galena rock, then you can see sometimes that it is naturally rusted into this reddish tone. Cinnabar, which we have seen before, is naturally red, although to create the deep, rich vermilion, the iron, uh, sorry, the mercury and the sulfur would be separated and then recombined to create a deep, rich vermilion. And there on the far right, this beautiful crystal that creates realgar, the orange pigment. Here is on the left, uh, Anthony van Dyck and these robes being painted in vermilion. Perhaps he used a combination of various reds, but this light pinkish tone, almost orange, is typical of vermilion. On the far right, uh, minium or red lead being used by Albrecht Dürer in his Virgin and Child. Vermeer, again, now this time using Madder Lake or alizarin to create those deep red hues in the blouse here on the left. And on the right, you have Peter Paul Rubens. Notice the deeper tone of red being created through crimson and carmine from the Kermes beetle, mixing it with vermilion and then creating highlights in lead white and glazing it with the carmine lake. Here then are the cochineal and the Kermes beetles. On the left, the cochineal beetle coming from the Americas, from Mexico in North America, while the Kermes beetle comes typically from Europe. Uh, you can see the Kermes beetle 
is extremely small and then here as it dies becoming these small reddish spots that are ground up into the pigment. Some examples now of kermes being used. And as I said, it comes from Europe, so European painters tended to use the kermes beetle to create their red lake, which is the case over here. And this Byzantine emperor's mantle, which we have here in the Vienna Schatzkammer, also created with the carmine red from the kermes beetle. Moving to the last of the three primary colors, to blue, we see it also has its interesting history, beginning with the unique Egyptian blue. And this was unique to ancient Egypt and disappeared for most of history, although it was revived in 1815 when a British researcher discovered the formula, or rediscovered the formula to create Egyptian blue once more. On the other hand, lapis lazuli has been known to the classical world for the longest time because of its unique qualities and it has been traded coming mostly from Afghanistan. Indigo is a dye and I mentioned it comes from the indigofera uh, plant, also commonly called woad. And from this you extract the colored liquid which is then dried and you create your pigment from the dried dye. Azurite is a blue pigment that's been used uh, from the 1300s and was very common during say the Renaissance period being copper, a copper carbonate and is slightly toxic. Uh, smalt being a blue which we don't hear of typically today, it did not have a very long history from 1540 to around 1800. And the reason for that is that typically it fades. We'll see an example of this then. Prussian blue being created from iron is a, a blue that we still use today. It was uh, discovered in 1724. And then in 1830, finally, we create a synthetic ultramarine. And ultramarine, as you know, comes from lapis lazuli, and this was a very rare, expensive pigment. And after much research in the industrial age, we were able to synthetically recreate the actual substance of lapis lazuli to make synthetic ultramarine, which then from 1830 to the present is still used today. Cerulean blue, a much lighter blue, uh, began in 1860 and continues until today. Indigo, which is organic and a dye and so fairly unstable, was then replaced by synthetic indigo in 1897. Cobalt blue, 1882, also has a fairly short history but is a very beautiful, intense blue. Then moving into the 20th century, 1935, the creation of manganese blue. And in fact, manganese blue is not being created today because of a lack of manganese, but you still might be able to stock up on some. Uh, finally, phthalocyanine blue from copper, Another beautiful blue created by the year 1935 and in use today. So let's have a look at some examples of these. Here is the lapis lazuli stone and even in its natural state it is quite beautiful. However, uh, artists and alchemists have gone to great lengths to combine it in oil in such a way that it doesn't lose that brilliant blue hue. Even in its ground form, as you see here, it lacks some of the original brilliance of its natural stone form. Smalt here in the middle then and in its ground form and there on the far right, azurite. Here is a good example of Egyptian blue in the headdress of this figure here, as well as the armbands and its unique quality. On the far right, 
uh, Raphael, this beautiful virgin that we have here in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. And of course, the robe would be in lapis lazuli during the Renaissance, uh, when artists were commissioned to create works, it was even stipulated in their contracts how much lapis lazuli would cost and how much would be used and so on, because it was such a precious pigment. Indigo uh, being used by Anthony van Dyck here to create this blue satin shadows uh, in the pants that you see of this figure. But he didn't use just indigo, the mid-tones would use indigo plus lead white, the highlights indigo plus azurite. So to create a whole series of different tones of blue. There on the right, Velázquez, the sky being in this soft greenish bluish azurite tone, mixing the azurite with lead white and traces of bone black, red ochre and calcite. Here on the left, Velázquez, his beautiful uh, Venus, and unfortunately her robe must have been a beautiful blue color at one point in history, but he painted it with smalt and it faded over time. On the right, the famous boy in blue, the blue boy by Gainsborough, and how did he create this blue? Through Prussian blue. Moving into more modern periods now, uh, Berthe Morisseau, Summer's Day, 1879. She's using cerulean blue to create the hues of this coat over here. Cerulean blue plus white and black overpainting uh, with ultramarine. And on the right, Matisse, Le Fauve, as he was called in France, the wild beast using these strong colors and the blue that you see on the right then, a strong cobalt blue mixed with white. How would you create verdigris then? Moving on to some of the secondary colors like green and orange and violet. Green and uh, from ancient times was created by making rust appear on copper. You take your copper here, uh, the thinner the better, and you place it uh, in vinegar or suspended above vinegar, and eventually it will turn green, and from the green it will also turn blue. And so this greenish tint that is the natural rust of copper became known as verdigris. Here you can see in the robes of this figure painted by Raphael that indeed he was using verdigris but he was painting in layers and an analysis has shown that he began with lead white as his foundation and then painted in lead tin yellow on top of that and then glazed the verdigris on top of the lead tin yellow to create those unique tones that you see in this figure's dress. I would now like to talk about dyes because there are lake colors created from dyes and the process is very interesting. So reading here the text, dyes called lake colors use organic pigments from plant and animal extracts which need to be fixed to a substrate or mordant such as alum or metallic salt. So a dye is typically used for changing the color of textiles and plant-based dyes include woad, which is indigo blue, uh, also indigo blue from the east, but in Europe uh, indigo was from woad, madder, which is red or pink or orange, weld or dyer's weed, also called rocket or mignonette, is a yellow dye, saffron also gives us a yellow dye, Gamboge tree resin, which is a dark mustard yellow. And we have to include animal uh, products as well. So the insect-based dyes like the kermes, which is crimson from Europe, the cochineal, which is carmine from the Americas, and mollusk-based dyes like the murex, which gives us purple and blue, octopus or cuttlefish, sepia browns, 
and cow urine from India giving us Indian yellow. Green dyes, especially in England, were produced by dyeing in woad, blue, and then in weld, yellow, and the combination would give green. Purple in Europe was produced by dyeing in woad, blue, and then red from the madder or kermes beetles. Now talking about the mordant to fix the dye so it will uh, adhere to the textile. A mordant from mord to bite in French is an added fixative that fixes or bites the dye into the textile. And typical mordants include alum, lye, tannic acid, which is from oak gall, vinegar, ammonia, which is a stale urine, and various salts of copper, iron, potassium, or tin. Now, we have these pigments called lakes, and a lake is a pigment which results from precipitating a dye, which that means is boiling the liquid dye and its mordant until no liquid remains, just the solid powder. And lake pigments were then ground into oils and they were used in the Renaissance and in Baroque painting for typically for translucent glazes, especially in the creation of fabrics. But of course the problem is that they were organic and so they were fugitive. They're not very light fast. The word lake, incidentally, comes from the French word lac, or like lacqueur, uh, and comes to us via the Arabic lac and the Hindi lac. So, uh, it is interesting that then what artists did during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance is that in order to extract the actual dyed color from the cloth, they would soak the cloth in lye, which is an alkaline solution, and then that would free the pigment, the dye, from the cloth and they would dry it and they would then use that by mixing it either with their egg tempera or with their oil to paint with. Here is the famous Tyrian purple which is created from murex snails. This is the royal purple and it was valued throughout the ancient world and even now onto modern times because thousands and thousands of these mollusks had to be collected and then used to create just a small amount of the dye. And I've always been interested in this to understand exactly what was Tyrene purple and it seems that in fact there were several shades of Tyrene purple and that the upper one being more in say the magenta, the middle one being more in the violet and the bottom one being more in the scarlet kind of uh, area of purple. But this is the famous Tyrene purple of royalty. Here is a good example now of Madder Lake coming from the Madder Root, a dye being extracted and then dried, ground in oil and used in a paint to create the Madder Lake of this alizarin crimson and it was then used by Titian to create these beautiful red robes that you see here, even though it was not very light fast. If you would like to find out more about pigments, historical pigments, there are many online resources and one place to simply begin would be with wikipedia.org. Here their list of inorganic pigments and you can go down and as you scroll down you have the purples, the blues, the greens, the yellows and you can click on each and find out more about each of the pigments. If you want to go a bit deeper this online resource called webexhibits.org with its section on pigments has many interesting examples and I was able to draw from this website many of the examples that you have just seen of how artists have used specific pigments in their paintings throughout time. Colorlex, also a very interesting website, will give you more resource materials on the history of pigments, when they were used, timelines and so on. And artistcreation.com has to be, for me personally, as an artist, the most interesting site and the one which I reference most often. 
And if you click on, say, yellow over here, you will be brought to a page where you see PY1, PY2, PY3, pigment yellow 1, 2, or 3. And there it's carefully explained what goes into each of these uh, pigments, what the historical names are, since they go under many historical names, and then pieces of advice on whether it's toxic or not, and, and how it's been used in combination with other colors. It's a very rich site, full of uh, interesting anecdotes for the artist to research further. Cameo.mfa.org is the website for the conservation and art materials encyclopedia online. And here it's more for painting restorers or conservators. And the conservators then uh, can reference all of the different materials that have been used historically by artists. Natural pigments, which is Rublev colors, uh, and you can buy Rublev colors in tubes. They have lots of information on how they go about creating their pigments. Uh, Michael Harding being another source, also full of rich information. Now I would like to return to this interesting alchemical engraving, which is from the Basilica Philosophica from uh, Milius, and we've seen it before in another presentation where you have the world above and the world below as above, so below. And from the left, you have the world of the male in the day world and the female in the night world combined with this hermaphrodite alchemist in the center. So let's zoom in to this hermaphrodite alchemist and have a closer look at these trees in his garden. The outer ring of trees have to do with the planets and their metals. And you can see that because the symbol for that planet and metal is in the tree itself. Here you have the Saturn lead symbol, the Jupiter tin symbol, the Mars iron symbol, the Sun gold symbol, and then moving over Venus copper, Mercury quicksilver, and the moon, which is silver. But when we go to the inner ring of trees, we find more alchemical symbols. And these are not easy to interpret, but there are lists that can be found that have been published over time of the different symbols alchemists use for their various materials. This, for example, this cross with a square on top is a symbol of tartar. And this here being alum, and this is a very well-known symbol for salt. As we keep on going around, we find Solomoniac, Sulfur, and here Crocus Mars. Now, Crocus Mars, with a bit of research, reveals itself to be red iron oxide. And indeed, we artists use red iron oxide as a pigment. You can buy it, and for example, Old Holland has uh, iron oxide red. Or a pigment we've met with before, it is in fact orpiment. And here the alchemist then is using red as an iron oxide, yellow through orpiment. And if we go a bit further past the vitriol, we come to verdigris, which we saw is a greenish tint coming from copper. Further down, cinnabar, which we've experienced as a reddish tone. And uh, at the very bottom, you have this red line on the left symbolizing sulfur, the green line on the right symbolizing mercury, and these two coming together in one head and spewing forth what? Spewing forth this combination of mercury and sulfur as mercuric sulfide. And mercuric sulfide is basically the prime ingredient of cinnabar, which when it's treated becomes vermilion. So he is, in a sense, standing on the vermilion lion. That, just to give you an example of how alchemy and painting have been operating hand in hand for really most of their history. To finish then, I would just like to review how during this trimester here at the Vienna Academy, we've been creating a painting 
as an alchemical work. And the way we've been doing that is we've been treating our canvas as an alchemical vessel and then using pigments that correspond to the planetary metals. What are the planetary metals? Just to review them at the bottom. Saturn then being related to the basis of all metals, lead. And then moving up, Jupiter being related to tin, Mars related to iron, and Venus related to copper. Then we move towards the more noble metals, Mercury being related to the metal Mercury, and uh, the Moon being related to silver, the Sun being related to gold. So, let us imagine how to create a painting that incorporates all of these planetary metals. Treating the canvas then as our chemical vessel and wanting to use all of the planetary metals in the pigments, we began by creating an imprimatura in lead white, lead tin yellow, and cobalt yellow. And we did that because the lead white gives us the Saturnine element in the painting. We could have used lead white, Naples yellow, I mean genuine Naples yellow here, minium, which is red lead, or if we could find it, we would have used chrome yellow, red or orange, but this particular pigment is very difficult to find these days. We combined lead tin yellow to include the jovial or Jupiter aspect in the painting as well and lead tin yellow 1, lead tin yellow 2, or cerulean blue, any of these would have incorporated tin, which is to say Jupiter in the painting, but we found some traditional lead tin yellow, which we ordered in and used. Then we began what is called the Brunei underpainting, and the Brunei uses browns to underpaint. And we're fortunate that many of the brown tones, in fact, come from iron. They're iron oxides. This includes iron oxide red, but also the ochres, the yellow, red, and brown ochres, the siennas, like raw and burnt, the umbers, which are raw and burnt, or red earth, Venetian red, green earth, Prussian blue, Mars black. They all have iron. In our particular case, if you recall, we mixed iron oxide red with ultramarine blue, and from that combination we were able to create a series of warm and cold browns, and from those warm and cold browns we were able to get this great variety of warms and colds in our underpainting. Next, we wanted to incorporate Venus, copper, into our paintings and thalocyanine blue, emerald green, as well as homemade verdigris would give us that. Malachite, chryscola, and azurite being other copper colors. So I was able to incorporate thalo blue as well as verdigris in my painting when I was glazing over the underpainting of browns. Finally, moving from mercury to silver to gold, Mercury, the beautiful pigment that has mercury in it, is vermilion, which is mercuric sulfide from cinnabar. And so I incorporated the vermilion in this phoenix rising from the Ouroboros towards my interpretation of the Philosopher's Stone. And the Philosopher's Stone used silver leaf and gold leaf in the center to give us both the lunar element and the solar element uh, is in the final aspect of the painting. Out of fun, I call this the Lapis Pictorum as opposed to the Lapis Philosophorum. It is the artist's stone. So thank you very much for listening to this uh, lecture on the alchemy of historical pigments and just to give you an idea of some of the activities that we've been up to here at the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art during our 2019 winter trimester on the alchemy of paint. My name is Lawrence Caruana and I'd be very happy to welcome you here in Vienna if you would like to join us and I hope you enjoyed this series of lectures on alchemy and painting. Thank you very much.